and welcome to the Sunday session. We'll uh, start with uh, with you, Mike. I want to approach this uh, this topic from from the point the standpoint of uh, research um, on ecological dynamics, learning models, and this is something that I've come across since joining um, AIK, or rather, I'd come across it beforehand, but I've I've really um, been able to dive in deeper into uh, this psychological model of, of learning. Thanks very much to the fact that AIK have got two um, top researchers in the field. Um, and I, the great thing is that the, these guys are way up there in their ivory tower researching this stuff, but at the same time, they can leave that tower and get out on the pitch and actually um, in, uh, put this into practice on, on the pitch. Uh, so James Vaughan and Marcus Sullivan. Uh, Marcus Sullivan's now gone on to become professor of uh, football at uh, Norwich uh, at, at Norway Sports Sciences. But I think not that this is a foundation of ecological dynamics learning model, but in football terms, this is where you have to go to find out how kids develop, how children learn football. And this quote, uh, I think, says it all that. You know, it is street football, uh, playground football that actually breeds uh, intelligent footballers. And so what AIK is doing from very first, uh, you know, six year olds that come into the club is that we're working on on building street football into our training sessions. And the it, for me, having worked four years at uh, my previous club, Solentuna, where I've built up um, um, a training session plan for all these age groups. Uh, and a lot of the, the ideas were sort of taken from here, but now coming to ICO, I can see the context and I can also see, right, actually, if I'd had my time again, I would change uh, a lot of these uh, things. So what I want to focus on is, is how um, James Warren, Mark O'Sullivan have developed um, this ecological model and how it's then uh, coached uh, at the club. So if we can forward on to the next slide. <clears throat> now here's, um, Steve, you mentioned that it, this came from sort of Spalletti's, uh, the topic perhaps came from Spalletti's uh, quote. And Napoli are one of these teams that are or seem able to play almost organically um, uh, depending on what the opposition is, it's very difficult perhaps to see what they're trying to do from one week to the next because the players are actually adapting to the opposition, finding spaces. And here's a quote from James Vaughan in, in respect to this feed that was in Twitter. Um, and he's, he's using a key word uh, there, which is an um, e ecological uh, psychology term of shared affordances. Now, for those of you not familiar, there is, of course, with psychology or any um, academic topic, I guess there's, they've got their own language, but affordances are really the opportunity to act. So based on what a player is perceiving in a certain situation, different players will have different perceptions of what they can do uh, with what the environment and the opposition basically afford them uh, with the uh, sort of creative ideas of how they solve a particular situation. And so when it, when it comes to uh, teams, shared affordances, where I have to be on the same wavelength as if I'm passing the ball, the per player who's receiving the ball has to be on that same wavelength. And, and that would be, uh, could be termed a shared affordance. And what we do at AIK is we work on basically uh, allowing players the creativity and this, and this learning, sort of open learning platform to develop these shared affordances. And um, next slide, please. <laughs> and this, this is a model that, that James Warren's um, uh, take, uh, brought out. And if you look at this triangle with uh, task, player and environment, and you, you know, the, like here, the task, uh, that's sort of understandable, players understandable, environment is, uh, it could be everything from, you know, it's a rainy pitch, um, the size of the pitch, the numbers of players, 
but it can also be subtle things that you may not be fully aware of if, if you haven't thought about the process before. And that could be yeah, like cultural baggage. Um, so for example, we've got, uh, AIK have got quite a lot of kids um, who come from uh, slightly poorer ethnic minority areas and have got a completely different football culture to perhaps the uh, you know classic blonde Swede kid um, where you, they've played football in the playgrounds. Um, there's perhaps a lot of value in nutmegging um, an opponent uh, and it, 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 there's a lot of sort of status involved in in that kind of aspect and this this then determines a little bit of their perceptions and uh, affordances that they will perhaps look for the nutmeg more than the pass uh, whereas I think Swedish players brought up with a more traditional coaching will will be more passing players um, and what we work on then is is what we call shaping intentions. What, what, what are the players actually trying to achieve on the pitch? And the key, key uh, factors with intentions is, you know, uh, going forwards, we want to score. Um, when we're defending, we want to stop the opposition from scoring. Now, that might sound, again, very obvious, but with intentions, uh, you, you find these days that uh, quite a lot of intentions are also um, slightly skewed, for example, by the concept of high intensity press. So you see training drills where coaches are working on real high intensity press and the defenders are just hunting around like headless chickens. There's no sort of, I am defending this end of the pitch and I'm working from here upwards. Instead, like for example, in um, um, a rondo 5v2 or something, you often see the two players in the middle are just chasing around, chasing around, chasing around, and not actually defending any particular um, end of the pitch. And therefore, that uh, behaviour is then replicated in match situations where you get a lot of defenders in modern football just following the ball, and the player goes in behind them without them noticing. So you actually have to, as a coach, shape intentions by making sure that the players are, are focused on what they're actually supposed to achieve and that is a important coach's role then going across with the training session design you're you're looking for perception action and you're as a coach educating their attention to what you want them to achieve and build shared affordances um so what our teams um at, you know five aside age and seven aside age they really don't play in any tactical shape at all. Um, they'll just go out on the pitch and solve it themselves. And we do find that when we come up to the 9v9 in the age of say, uh, you're sort of 13, 14 in Sweden, you, you're beginning to see some sort of tactical shape just to start the match um, and perhaps to have a starting point. Um, but uh, we try to, within that, okay, start as a 2-4-2 two, two or uh, in nine aside. Um, but from that, the movement should be as free as, um, depending on where the opposition are, where the spaces are and what our intentions are. And if we go to the next slide. <clears throat> so learning wise, we've pretty much reduced um, on the right, you see this, this little, almost yin yang um, type diagram that when players have the ball, all we're coaching is, okay, can you play through the opposition? Can you play around the opposition? Or can you play over the opposition? And by using what we call a sort of constraints-led approach, where perhaps you highlight uh, particular behaviors by um, giving them more points, you will work on players trying to play through perhaps more than around or uh, more than over. And the same thing defensively, that the key intention is stop the opposition from playing through you, playing around you or playing over you. And so all the coaching sessions and the, the coaching philosophy is built around constraints that highlight behaviors um, on these, these three points. And to achieve that, your coaching session uh, has to be built with these four on the left-hand side, what we call representative information, that it's got to replicate the game. 
So every exercise we do has to have a ball, has to have opponents. Um, there has to be a consequence in the sense that you lose the ball, um, the opponents can counterattack. Um, you also need to get in sense of you know, winning and losing um, to uh, bring up the sort of intensity in the session. And there has to be direction. So we're attacking in that direction. We're defending in this direction. And this is to sort of build the context of, um, of an action training session. So when we analyze um, coaching sessions or coaching design that um, our, our coaches bring out, that's one of the key things. All right, have you got all these four factors um, in, your, in your session? And if we just move to the next slide. My final slide, um, these sort of four points around shared affordances. Now, there's a lot of research has been done around affordances, despite the fact that ecological psychology is still quite a young science. Um, but with shared affordances, there is not, isn't as much research about how teams uh, develop. But I've, in my time with AIK, I've, I've really been on a, on a rocket learning curve, uh, despite having worked in football for almost 30 years, it's been tremendously exciting to see what I've done in the past um, and put it into context with uh, this learning model. And there are four things I thought I'd bring out. One is in the bottom corner, you, you see uh, Ramos there from the, uh, the World Cup and Benfica will always work with their players, will, will always train in every single position. I think Johan Cruyff was very much into this, that if you want players to understand their teammates, they need to understand those positions as well. And so for me and for the club, it, it's very important that, you know, forward should know what uh, a right back's doing or a midfield is doing in order to be able to time their runs and movements and be able to sort of share that affordance to be able to think, OK, what will this player be doing? Um, what do I need to do in relation to that player? Um, and interesting, one of our coaches was talking to uh, the assistant coach in our senior team, who is an ex uh, well, star um, forward uh, in the team. And he, he asked him, you know, what can I do to improve my forwards game understanding? And he said, to make them play centre back. <laughs> and there is a lot um, to be learned from, from perhaps particularly playing opposite positions, but also in the context of understanding what the whole team is trying to achieve. Now, the, the, the top picture with the little sort of tactical uh, uh, green circles versus the white circles, this is, this is sort of perhaps breaking slightly with the um, shared affordances idea that everything should be creative and, and the players should own uh, the whole process uh, of being self-organizing. Because what I've noticed is that um, AIK players are incredibly good at solving um, a self-organizing attack versus a self-organizing defense. But then watching them in games, you sometimes see that in, for example, build-up play, that they'll get stuck into a, a trap uh, from a very set uh, pressing system and not be able to resolve this. And so what we've started introducing is, okay, we'll, we'll allow the build-up team to just shape themselves exactly the way they wish, um, give them constraints to sort of encourage them to perhaps look for particular solutions, but we'll set up the opposition in a very set way. So they're not allowed to press completely creatively. They have to try and follow a system that perhaps some of our opponents would have and thus um, inspire um, problem solving uh, for them there. Um, if I go down to the bottom, the uh, picture here, this is also an interesting sort of environmental baggage um, aspect that a lot of the players have, have done rondos. And when you do rondos, one of the, the sort of solutions to a rondo is, uh, well, you, you go wide. And centre backs um, will have also uh, see, OK, opposition are pressing with two players. Let's go wide. And 
they get stuck into wide zones, which then perhaps trap them into positions where they don't have all the options playing round through and over simply because, well, that's what's been done before. So as a, as a coach, you have to be aware of this and, and perhaps um, come with suggestions to change the, the behavior. And for example, this could be parents pressure that, uh, you know, knock it, clear it or whatever. Um, but how many goalkeepers, for example, in this picture would say, OK, well, I'll just dribble through the, the middle of these two. I'll take the ball beyond the forwards line. And we're trying to encourage our players to be that free and creative and see, well, this is the best solution in this uh, area. But if there is environmental baggage, you have to break that down to um, bring that out. And my final point is coaching. I've, I've taken a sort of classic coaching point where um, a coach with experience um, freezes a session to deliver a point. And I was... Um, I would like to refer back to Randy Smith, who was on just the uh, other week with one of your Sunday sessions. He had a, he is very, very interesting listening to him because he has got a lot of ecological psychology dynamics going on in his style of coaching, although he may not be aware of it, <laughs> but it was um, really enjoyable listening to that. And one of the things he said was one of his forwards had come up to him and said, oh, you know, I can't get past John on the blue line. Uh, what am I going to do? And he'd said, well, go and ask John. And that is fantastic that when you want to deliver a coaching point, you see something that's being locked up and perhaps say in build up play, your centre back is getting frustrated. Just go up to him, freeze the play and say to him, uh, you know, uh, are you happy with the positions the players are taking in front of you? And he said, no, I, I haven't got anybody to play around to. I want him to be there. And then when those players start building this dialogue, you're building shared affordances without you sort of imposing your view onto the players. And I think when you can start building those relationships between players and that they become self-coaching, that is the way forward to systemless um, tactical uh, play in the future. So that's, um, I'd like to conclude on that and allow somebody else to, a bit of time to come in. Uh, move swiftly then on to our second presentation of the day. Um, Jan van Loon, I'll uh, hand the floor to you. Um, hopefully you can see uh, the screen with uh, Bangalore FC in front of you. Um, yes. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, we are BFC, so uh, that means five months ago, uh, maybe six months ago, I, I never heard of, of, of this club. And uh, now I'm one of them. So uh, there's always nice to realize, okay, what, what is uh, BFC? Um, and you see a few pictures, you see um, a lot of uh, championship and, and uh, high results. And um, this is the club captain, um, Sunil Shetri, and he's a real uh, ambassador of uh, football in, in India, but also in Asia. Um, he's the um, uh, all-time top scorer in the competition and is uh, captain of the club and is captain of the in, uh, Indian national team. Uh, and he's actually born in uh, Nepal. Um, but um, what I want to say is that he does also a lot of um, presentations on television about uh, what, it, what it means to, uh, to live a healthy life. He is now 37, I think, um, and still uh, playing on the highest level in India. Um, so what uh, comes out a lot um, is that um, this club exists uh, uh, 10 years from the start of the ISL and the academy um, almost uh, six years now, so five and a half years. And the owners uh, first visited um, uh, clubs in Europe, clubs in uh, South America, um, uh, clubs in Asia that they thought, okay, how do we want to build the system? And what I think is interesting also what uh, Mike shared about you have the academy teams and you have the shadow teams 
that um, that's pretty much uh, the setup of uh, of this club. Now, India is um, is a big country, um, and um, there are many different languages, and um, the people don't speak one language. Eh? Not everybody speaks English, so um, that means that. Um, yeah, it's 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 sometimes uh, hard to um, explain it with uh, words. So you have to find ways of um, a, a typical way of okay, this is uh, how football is played. Eh? We are BFC. Okay, what is our playing style? Um, so um, you maybe can imagine that is one of the players are going is going home for uh, for Christmas. And then it's a two hour, a two day travel back home and then two uh, day back here. So in total already four days holiday gone by only traveling. Just to, to for me, of course, that was also uh, everything new. Um, now the other clubs in the competition uh, and also have academies is uh, Mumbai City, who is also part of the city group. Uh, FC Goa, uh, Northeast, um, um, yeah. So, so there are in uh, Kerala. Uh, so, so that 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 are the the clubs who play in the ISL and also uh, put energy in academy football. So it's a really uh, build up um, from the start. Um, so if you uh, look at at uh, references. Yeah, then um, that's not so easy to um, that, uh, let's say the players, the reference that the players have is uh, not the same as the reference that youth players have in Europe or in South America. Uh, so, um, and of course, if we start with the universal football rules, sort of the traffic rules of football, um, then of course that is a good starting point um, um, when you uh, try to communicate uh, with players about, uh, okay, how to solve uh, certain football situations. And um, so the universal football rules is that um, it's always uh, played from one side to another side. Uh, so it's always a rectangle uh, where, the, uh, where the length is, is twice as long as the width of the pitch. Um, uh, when the ball goes out of the pitch and you kicked it, then the other team gets the ball. Just, just universal football rules. And um, uh, just be aware of that uh, in this country, uh, players, and parents and coaches uh, uh, normally don't have the reference of okay. Uh, it means we want to play forward. Uh, we want to we want to um, uh, exploit space in behind or between the defensive line of 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 the opponent. And that is, let's say, the football ingredients uh, worldwide that we are used to. So the cultural approach. Uh, here is more than that when you have the ball, you start dribbling till you lose the ball and the opponent starts dribbling till they lose the ball. And then um, most of the games are um, individual actions. And um, as soon as they pass the ball, it's most of the time to the, to the other uh, team. Uh, so that, is, that, is, that sounds maybe negative, but that is, that's not what I mean. Um, but it's, it's very important that I understand where the reference of, of these players come from. So um, the cultural approach is also uh, uh, don't uh, show yourself that much uh, your, your qualities, just, just be humble and, and give the ball um just start dribbling and and uh, when you pass you pass the ball back or sidewards um but don't uh, take risk uh, to to play the ball forward eh? might uh, maybe lose the ball 
uh, in my opinion, that the consequence of that is that a lot of training sessions are controlled training sessions. So controlled by the coach, um, a lot of um, uh, training sessions that are not no decision making, not uh, awareness. Uh, the execution of the action is is uh, just a technical um, a technical drill. So now for me it's very interesting. Okay, uh, what pathway are we going uh, to give those players a certain reference that there is more than just what there is now? Um, we'll go to the next slide. So just. A little bit, this is our home stadium, a beautiful stadium with a lot of uh, character in it. So uh, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, so what is the role of the coach in that? Uh, so how do we create better game understanding um, when uh, there is a player who was always told by uh, dribbling with the ball is a good decision? Um, and when you lose the ball, you just get it back. And then that player the, of the opponent is dribbling. So yeah, that is, that is what uh, the reference is of a football game. So how do we get a, a better game understanding of exploiting space, understanding space and time, uh, seeing options forward, uh, having uh, the ability to uh, exploit those um, options forward. And uh, what we want to do, we want to do that uh, movement from the perspective of the, of the players. Um, and I use in that, I use uh, the action, action theory. So the action theory is based on that uh, there is not an ideal technique of passing or dribbling or heading but every situation requires a certain uh, form of execution. Um, so you have to pick your right, uh, your right tool to solve the football situation, but from the perspective of the player. So that means that uh, it's not controlled uh, training sessions anymore, but a lot of transition games, a lot of reacting games, a lot of uh, visual games of looking for the next option. So not the closest option, but maybe even an option forward. Um, but everybody can maybe imagine if you never pass the ball in behind over a longer distance and you start doing that, that you don't have the reference of how you have to hit that ball. Uh, because often it's too short, often it's too long, or often it's totally in the wrong direction or it's not uh, um, compared to the qualities of your teammates. Uh, if, if it's a very uh, uh, fast player, or it's maybe more a player who wants um, uh, the ball in his feet and from there uh, starting the action. So that is all uh, involved in the choices that at the moment uh, we are making to uh, get the perspective of the players better. Now, one of the things that is a challenge is asking questions. Uh, so if a player doesn't understand the drill and I ask, uh, everybody agrees? Yes, okay. And then after the first pass, I see already, or the first action, I see already that uh, the players didn't understand. So now after five months, it, it is getting better. Um, and that is a big challenge for us, for me as a coach, to understand, okay, wh what is possible and what is still very difficult for the players and the coaches uh, to understand. So it comes from a total uh, a, a, a way of playing into, okay, can we uh, give another perspective to the players and the coaches? So. Now, when we were talking about systemless uh, football, um, then I was thinking, OK, what are the benefits of a team organization? How does a team organization help players to understand what um, 
what kind of actions in what kind of situations are the most successful. And that of course, uh, you can, the benefit of a team organization, let's say in senior football could be um, uh, winning a game against a certain setup of the opponent or during the game changing the team organization uh, because you're leading uh, the game or you're, you're losing uh, so that you have to adapt and that uh, players are able to understand, okay, when we do this, then this is the consequence. These are the actions that are required to get a better communication and better understanding, not only, of course, verbal, but especially in uh, in the movements, in the in the actions of the players, that they are aligned. Now, um, so uh, what are the team intentions and what are the individual intentions from those team intentions? Um, now, we know we like to uh, to look at a playmaking style or a counter-attacking style. Now, both. Uh, situations can be, uh, of course, uh, played in, in many different ways. Um, and uh, let's say if you want a playmaking style, of course, the, as a team intention, then the individual intentions are different than from a counter-attacking style. Nowadays, you see that um, uh, during the game, uh, the, uh, the playmaking style or the counter-attacking style are constantly uh, switching. Uh, so that means that players uh, have to look at, okay, what kind of um, individual intentions should be um, uh, done uh, to uh, achieve the team intentions. Now, if you look at academy football, how could uh, team organization benefit academy football uh, to give players a certain reference of how to divide uh, the space and, and, and the responsibilities and what happens if somebody uh, leaves uh, his or her position. So how can we keep uh, uh, the shape so that we can uh, keep on uh, communicating, uh, passing, dribbling, executing, defending, pressing, dropping uh, in, a, in a similar way, in a, in, in a way that we can better communicate with each other to get the highest outcome of a football game. So what needs to be learned by the players, um, that is the awareness of the football situation. And um, if we talk about, let's say, under sevens, under nines, uh, under elevens, under thirteens, uh, before they go into 11 against 11 football, then um, it's a lot of uh, small-sided games, um, a lot of transitions, um, a lot of goals, um, and especially to recognize, okay, what, what, how can we achieve uh, scoring goals and how can we achieve preventing the opponent from scoring? Um, and therefore, it's very important that the players are uh, challenged by dealing with these circumstances. Uh, so what kind of um, difficulties uh, do we set up in our training sessions to get players uh, giving that awareness, uh, deciding uh, uh, what and how to do it, and then executing uh, the decision uh, made. Uh, so if we uh, go into 11 against 11, and players uh, go from um, small-sided games, let's say 9v9, into 11 against 11. Um, it's still the same, but of course there are much higher, bigger distances and, and, and um, much more space um, to uh, exploit, but also um, stop the opponent from exploiting space. So how to get the best result? Uh, that, so, so how can we win games uh, and at the same time, how can we do that in the way that uh, our players un understand? And, and um, now that means that it can be in an academy that you don't follow directly uh, a written out uh, curriculum 
from the club in a step by step, but you especially look at what kind of qualities are special in the team eh? and what kind of qualities can be developed in the team. Uh, so in youth football, uh, the best result is not always uh, the result of the game of winning a game, but much more the improvement of solving football problems on the pitch. So if I look at, um, at systemless uh, football, um, then I still think that we need references um, of a certain con uh, conditioned uh, games, conditioned training sessions where players are able to take decisions and that um, the coaches are able to um, prevent challenges for the players, exactly the right challenges what they need at that moment. Uh, therefore, um, uh, we need to help the coaches to understand the players to understand uh, in what kind of uh, game we are and how to deliver those training sessions with the players you have and not like uh, just, uh, okay, uh, this is the drill uh, on Monday uh, next week, that is the drill we are going to do. Um, no, okay, what do the players need? What has to be developed? And how can we uh, make sure that the players get uh, the best possible option to um, uh, to get the maximum out of their uh, abilities? Joe, it's uh, screen is all yours. Okay, so as uh, Mike and Jan have done superbly, um, I'm going to try and summarize a lot of detail and uh, the framework and models into just a few slides. Um, to know the detail and depth that they go into as well. So. Um, in terms of our approach to player development, um, we have, I guess, specific frameworks I just suggested. So in terms of like phase specific objectives. So um, the start of their journey, we, we have pre-academy, but they come into the building at under nine. So from our foundation phase, we have a real focus on them uh, learning to love the game or actually just enabling that love for the game. Um, and what we don't want it to be is something where they like the foundation phase looks completely different to the youth development phase. Um, everything has to exist within each other. So the first teams, obviously, main objective is uh, in winning games that they still have to love the game as their fundamental behaviour. So um, what, what you can see, and this isn't in particular to any clubs or what other people do, but um, it's so much fantastic work across academies and football clubs where they do such a good job of making memorable experiences and enabling this love for the game at um, foundation phase, then all of a sudden there's a seems to be a switch where coaches spend a lot of time trying to coach all of that love out of the game. And um, it's such an important base towards everything that we do. Um, and then it goes on in terms of learning how to train. So understanding about um, what it takes to be a day-to-day -day footballer, I guess, before they come into the full-time model of which they start understanding about learning how to win. So, for example, different tactics, strategies, um, how to get a competitive advantage before entering a first team. So in terms of our, our training model, again, trying to summarise, it's uh, based around three key areas of, of learning. So um, our model, we don't really have schemes of work as such. It would be very individual specific. Um, but the actual model, the framework of learning is, is based around space learning, interleaving and retrieval practice. So, for example, on a week to week basis, um, on a, say, Tuesday, the, it'll, it'll be a very similar, similar session in terms of um, an area of the pitch that you're working. But with the seven days in between allows enough time to forget. And it's in, in order to remember, you need to the most effective way of remembering something or learning something is to forget it first. If, um anyone's ever read or seen the forgetting curve i believe it's um on average you forget 90 percent of what you learned after seven days so the idea is that by um ensuring the program is constrained to have a recall that you have to increase your efforts to try and remember something so um 
it ingrains the learning. And then as you um, are learning, then the, the recall can be relaxed. Um, and as I'll allude to later, it's more about how you adapt your learning with different environments and to the context as opposed to um, learning something in isolation, which leads on to interleaving. So um, the game's the game. We don't try to isolate specific topics and um, disregard other areas of the game. So it's about learning multiple subjects within a topic that you're learning. So the more that the training sessions are relevant, contextual to the game, um, the better. And then retrieval practice, so a lot of our coaching, whether that's the use of technology, um, a way that sessions are designed or periodized to ensure that there is constant recall uh, throughout the program, um, particularly with coach delivery in terms of question Q and A's. Um, I, won't take, I won't take credit for our, this four pillars of coaching. It was um, for those that may know Steve Rutter, um, if anyone knows, he's a walking, talking mastermind of coaching to me, so a bit of an encyclopedia of football. So um, I've tried, tested it and continued to use it for quite a number of years. So there's four, four key areas for our coach competency framework and helping players develop. So as I mentioned in the introduction around emotional intelligence, when working in human performance, if you're not able to uh, connect, inspire and have empathy with your participant, then uh, the other three really aren't too important. Um, so that's the absolute number one in terms of the, the type of coach now you connect with players. And then we work around how you manage your physical and human resources, uh, your subject specific knowledge, which obviously in our field would be coaching and football. And then obviously how we teach the game. So uh, a lot of work around zonal proximal development and understanding. So that's Vygotsky's model, if uh, you're unaware of it, basically about what players know and can do with guidance or without guidance is that area in between. And as I alluded to before about adaptive expertise, so when learning something novel, um, get the, getting them to the point where they might be able to do something in isolation. So for example, you're learning to pass a football, um, there might be something technical, there might not. It's just basically, can I get the ball from A to B? But as obviously you get older and more experienced, the, the context differs and you have to be able to adapt to the context and to us, that's what's real expertise as opposed to being able to do something um, in isolation. So how we go about it in terms of our, our session building, um, there's four main parts that we look at for a session. So again, considering everything that I've just I spoke about, uh, we talk about priming the sessions and this can be done in uh, multiple ways. There's no set way that the coaches have to do it. So whether that's um, indoors prior to a session, again, using analysis technology through, um, it could be cognitive priming through uh, physical performance. So during warmups and leading into sessions, they're just making sure that whatever the outcomes that you're trying to achieve of the session are, that there's a constant golden thread that runs within the session. Um, which then moves on to behaviours. So um, ensuring that the parts of the practice or the next part of the practice is talking about the behaviours that you're going to need to be able to display and use in order to achieve an outcome. So if it's um, playing in tight spaces, for example, it's ensuring that players are being brave to get themselves on the ball and encouraging the behaviours. So the next part would then be our principles of how we play the game. Um, and then the last part, position specific. Well, I know we'll talk about systemless football uh, moving forward. In terms of position specific, this is based on time and space. Um, but where players are getting regular practice in real um, game context. Um, and then leading on to the more player development side, like the individual individualized approach so uh we have three key areas in terms of our philosophy so it being coach led and by being coach led i mean the facilitation of the environment um and being able to run as the interdisciplinary group towards the uh players development so in terms of individual development plans um just have someone leading the process but 
uh, for me, the most important part of the IDP philosophy is it about it being player driven. So ensuring players are being educated to take charge of their own careers, um, as you're seeing far more in uh, first team football with everything that surrounds them. It's not just playing the game anymore. They have to be able to handle a lot of external factors. And it's about us being able to help them again holistically to be an elite footballer in today's world. Um, but the most important part is about them being intrinsically motivated to improve each and every day. Um, I think we're really, I say lucky, uh, we're privileged is the better word, that um, I'm at a football club where the facilities are incredible. Um, provision's absolutely brilliant and they've got everything that they could possibly need to be a professional footballer. Um, and we see it as really it's for the players to make the most of the opportunity that's given to them as opposed to us forcing it upon them. Um, and players have different needs. So rather than trying to structure it to make sure that we're trying to throw everything at the player, they almost build their own programs that fit their needs, obviously with guidance and education as to why it's, certain facts might be important. So um, it might be a conversation later, Stephen, I'm sure, but we've we built a soccer bot, which is around um, learning the cognitive um, sexual action skills. Um, and it might not be for every player, but if players feel like it's going to benefit their program, then we can build a program for them that includes using the soccer bot. And then the final part is about being data informed. And we say informed because um, we can't take subjectivity away. There's a real mastery and art of coaching that numbers will never be able to um, um, be able to say what, what's right from wrong. But we do try and use data as much as possible to make objective decisions so we can say whether players are improving, not improving, measuring the training program, uh, measuring the game model, um, trying to use it to be as accurate as possible. And even if not getting down to the real fine detail of it, you at least narrow the lens of where you're looking. So we talk about where players need to get better. Um, it could be a thousand and more different things, but just by using data, you at least narrow the focus as to what area it might be that we're looking to improve. Um, and then to do that, we have individual development plans and it's, it's more built around uh, them again they'll they'll drive this process um, but being facilitated by coach and staff so more around what it is they want to achieve for a year or bigger career goals and that's where everything is based from it's about them as a, a human being um, and then building specific targets um, to help them uh, achieve that again from every department at the club they'll sit down with um physical performance, analysis, psychology, nutrition, to build a real all-rounded program um, and have targets for each one. And then the success criteria will be built around data. So how can we measure what it is that they're trying to improve? Uh, and then finally, their system goals is basically their day-to-day -day schedule is what it looks like and how they look to obviously improve their numbers uh, with the data to achieve the outcome targets and uh, hopefully achieve their performance goals or career plans, which is often obviously uncontrollable, but you give yourself the very best chance of doing so by at least having a framework to, to try. Yeah, so in general, like I said, trying to summarise as much as possible how we uh, look or at least have frameworks for player development at Norwich. Brilliant. Thanks, Joey. That was a, yeah, a real whirlwind uh, <laughs> glimpse of, uh, of the work you're doing there at, there at Norwich. Um, and hopefully it gives us all, from all three presentations there, a little bit of an idea of where, where each of the guys are at, at the clubs they're working at, the sort of the ways that they're working at. And I don't know where we'll sort of start trying to crystallize. I think one of the key phrases that Jan used was like reference points. So I think for our discussion, the reference points is this idea of systemless football. And I guess to maybe crystallize that is maybe, you know, for each of you, what do you actually think? What, what does it inspire you? What are the thoughts that you have when you hear that phrase systemless football and how much 
you know, in, in, in reality, in the work that you're doing, how much of a reference point is it in terms of what you do? Is it something that is like, yeah, that is a big, big light at the end of the tunnel. That's what we're aiming to produce. Or is just, yeah, that's just one way of looking at things and we may tinker with it, but we have many other views on football that we also bring into our ideas on player development. Well, Joe's gone green first. I'll, uh, yeah, Joe, if you want to jump in there first then and, and lead the way. Yeah, I mean, it's not, um, for me, systemless football, it's not, it's not a new concept. Um, you can, everyone can obviously do a bit of research. I think it uh, was first recognised, I guess, uh, Hungary, I believe, um, in the 50s, and has continually sort of jumped back. You can even argue around positional play being systemless, if you like, um, with Ajax and Cruyff. Um, and it's something that you look back to, again to invasion game principles so around create, maintain, exploit space, restrict, predict, deny. That's the first things that you're learning as a, as a child. And does it really change? It's only, um, I guess, in, in recent years, or I guess a few decades where they've tried to make things more organized with real specific instruction, I guess, more for the ease of I mean, clarity of messages you get across. And we've moved away from more principle-based football. It wasn't that long ago, Ralph Rangnick said about um, it is about principles and systems are just the steering wheel for the way you play the game. Um, and you hear more about principles here, like Pep Linder's talking more about pr principles as opposed to systems. Um, you look at other sports as well. So basketball, for example, um, very traditionally it would be the centre would be the, the tallest person possible that stand under a basket. But now centres can... They can dribble the ball, they can shoot. People are far more uh, athletically uh, balanced, if you like. Um, you get point guards that are, that are much taller than what they were as well. So um, I can only see football really going the same way. And I know it's getting a little bit more hype, even if it's not something that's new. But you see hybrid systems, you see players playing three or four different positions within games. So when I spoke earlier around adaptive expertise, that's exactly it, that they have to be able to play the game through principles to the context of and the environment that they're, they're playing within, as opposed to um, having a narrow mind, I guess, or narrow focus, because you end up actually missing the game and you're too focused on what it is that you have to do, um, as opposed to the real basics of what invasion games are. I'd, I'd like to uh, continue on that. I think um, Joe's absolutely right that the sort of idea of systemless football um, has existed. Um, I, I read a lot of uh, sort of history biographies and things like that. And um, Graham Sunas's biography, I, now for our uh, viewers, I'm, I'm not sure how many people know him other than perhaps Sky Sports expert or planting a flag in the middle of Fenerbahce's pitch when he was manager at Galatasaray. Um, but you know, he, he was a, a great central midfield um, captain for Liverpool in their, their successful era in the late 70s, early 80s. And, you know, a lot of people will have a, a picture of, you know, English football that time, 4-4-2, knock it long um, and, and play. But there's a lot of nuggets in, in his um, biography, which I could well, you know, recommend reading. And one of the key things he, he talks about really is, how systemless uh, football at Liverpool was. And he was a record signing um, when he went to them. And the first week, it's the sort of mid-season because there's no transfer windows then. The first week, the only training sessions they had was basically a bit of running, stretching, sprints and five-a-side football. And then he selected to start in the match on Saturday. And nobody said anything about, you know, what's, what's he supposed to do on the pitch? And um, so whilst he's thinking about this, Joe Fagan, who was assistant coach and very mild-mannered guy, um, sits down next to him at, uh, by chance. And so he, he asks him, you know, is there anything you, you know, nobody said, how am I supposed to play? Or, or... And um, Joe Fagan just exploded and just said, F off. We didn't spend all this money to teach you how to play football. And, and that was the expectation because players in those days had grown up knowing the game inside out with the way they learned by, by just playing, playing football with their mates um, in the park, uh, little 
pick me up uh, five aside, 10 aside, 13 aside, uh, different ages. Um, and you learn skills. Like if you were 10 years old and you're playing with 15 year olds, you, you, you learn fast what it takes in order for them to even want to pass the ball to you. Um, so how not to lose the ball, how, where can I play, et cetera. And I think this sort of knowledge um, has disappeared a lot from, from kids these days. You know, if, you see, if I see kids out, um, outside of fixed training sessions playing, what are they trying to do? Take free kicks or try and hit the bar? And, and you, know, you know, they're not learning the game. It's not jumpers for goalposts, and uh, to use that quote, um, taking place anymore. So we, as clubs developing players, we have a huge task on our hand to build this game understanding into the way we design training sessions. And just to take another example from Graham Souness, semi-final of the old European Cup, the equivalent of the Champions League, second leg, they're playing Bayern Munich. And five minutes before uh, their kickoff, Bob Paisley, who's manager, comes in and says to Sammy Lee, one of the midfield, you, Sam, you're, you're going to man-mark Paul Breitner today, the big central midfield general. And they'd never, you know, in the seven years that Graham Souness was there, that was the only tactical instruction he ever received. They hadn't worked on it in training or anything. And the, the players just adapted. And sure, yeah, they, they uh, got through to the final. <laughs> so the, the, you think 4-4-2, sure. But there's just so much positional intelligence uh, amongst the players there that they just completely adapted to being able to solve the situation that Sammy Lee is going to be man-marking that player. What impact is that going to have on my positional relationships with all my other teammates? And that Sammy Lee may not be able to, you can't pass him the ball <laughs> for the entire game because he's busy standing on Paul Breitner's toes. Uh, and I think that that sort of that's what the ecological psychology model of dynamic training is is trying to recreate is this type of learning of building the shared affordances between players. And I, so, you know, my ideas around structured training sessions for with a you know a thread running through uh, the entire session uh, you know is being blasted out of the water by what play, players young players at Oracle can do on the ball and what clever session design with this process of round through over uh, is creating um, fantastically skilled players it, it's still young because the, the club's been doing this for, I mean, our boys ball, what, turn 13 um, uh, next year. They, they're the first ones who will have come through the entire uh, process. And so it's just going to be fascinating to see what happens with these players, 14, 15, 16. What, what are they going to become? Um, have we created something fantastic? And I think, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I, I think uh, it's a very, very exciting model for uh, developing children. Yeah. And, and for you, Jan, so you have come from a, uh, a coaching background where you know, there was one <laughs> of the more, more famous iterations, uh, if you like, of possibly systemless football with total football. But even there, within how that is coached and how maybe the systemless football of today is coached, even in Holland, is, has changed. Yeah, because uh, the world has changed. And um, I must say, um, at the moment in India, because every presentation I heard, of course, you also look from the perspective of what I am doing here. Um, is not making a copy of European or a certain <coughs> club uh, in this club. Uh, I really want to look at okay, what is uh, here, what what are the qualities here, and how can we take ownership for the players and the coaches to uh, drive it forward. So, um, what what has inspired me a lot uh, over the last uh, six months is the. Uh, the teachings of uh, Raymond Verheyen, um, and that's the reverse engineering. 
So that is a process of um, uh, asking the players uh, on the pitch, okay, what is this situation and, and how did you come to a, to a decision? And um, so was it uh, maybe a technical uh, problem or was it an inside problem or was it a communication problem? Um, and what, you, what I experience is that uh, these players have much more knowledge about football um, by uh, playing FIFA, uh, uh, watching football, uh, because that is available from all over the world here also on television. So they have a lot of uh, tactical awareness in knowledge, but uh, doing it themselves, that is still a, a bridge too far. So uh, I've almost always worked in senior football, just a short um, a moment in, in uh, sorry, I always worked in academy football and just a few times in senior football. And uh, senior uh, youth football is not, a, let's say, um, a small version of senior football. Uh, so there are um, a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, qualities um, in developing mode. Uh, so, so let's say it's it's seventy percent or it's eighty percent or it's 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 not yet successful. Uh, because they do two things exactly right, but the third thing goes wrong, or that doesn't mean that that everything is uh, is wrong. Uh, so uh, that's why I use that reverse engineering of uh, looking through the, the the eyes of the player to the situation and explaining me what what uh, what uh, what happens. And um, like. Uh, my two colleagues uh, already uh, said, of course, you have to be able to design training sessions where that uh, decision making is still a part of, uh, of the doing. Uh, if you uh, take the decision uh, uh, taking away, uh, the decision making away um, uh, to uh, let the execution exactly you want it, and you keep on using that all the time that might be limiting to the to the um, let's say the, the the multiple flexible players that we need in the future does that mean that you never can isolate certain uh, situations no of course not sometimes for certain players with certain um, learning styles it's very good to isolate a situation and let it practice how you have to touch a ball in a certain situation and then as quick as possible, bring it back in, in uh, game related uh, situations that they can oversee and that they are really, uh, let's say, uh, reflecting um, the game that they have uh, in the weekend or uh, whenever they have the game. So what uh, we spoke about it before, Steve, about not having games, remember? Uh, that in India, um, there are just tournaments because the distances are often so far uh, that when you want uh, a level uh, opponent, uh, you have to travel uh, a, a, a full day before you are there. So um, that means that, that there is a lot of training. And at first I thought that was a bad thing. I thought, oh, that, that's not good. We have to play every weekend the game because that keeps everybody in the mood. But what I see with my coaches that they are much more looking at the individual development than on the next game that has to be played. And uh, every time when, when there are games, then I see that the coach directly goes back into preparing them in systems and patterns and control. And when this happens, then you have to do this. So yeah, it's interesting for me also how the coach development is. So what kind of steps a coach has to make first before uh, the coach can do the next step. Uh, so it's not only uh, uh, systemless football as a discussion point of uh, what what we see nowadays in international football in, on senior level, uh, but also how can we uh, help our coaches to understand that it's sometimes uh, better to uh, let control uh, go, but still 
understanding what kind of decisions are made by the by the players on the pitch. So that is at this moment where I am standing in uh, in India. And um, now at the end of this week, I go for uh, for a, a Christmas holiday, and then uh, start of January, I think I had enough time to reflect and uh, to look what kind of pathway we have to uh, go on with. That's 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 my approach. Yeah, there's a, a few points there, Jan. I think the <clears throat> the sort of the coaching the coaches side will put aside I think for a for a little bit later in the in the discussion I think the the idea there that you brought up that obviously you're not playing games so you're just looking at the individual development so there's less of an idea on this is your position and this is how you play your position um and I'll bring in Joe at this point so noticed in your <clears throat> in your slides we you touched upon this idea of position specifics so just wondered how how those two sides go together if you're looking at players being adaptive and being able to play in all areas of the pitch and how that fits in with this model of ultimately when we get to a certain level you know we're, the first team still plays with a right back a left back center halves midfield center forward right wing left wing etc mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so I guess uh, younger age groups, um, and I, all the way through, I guess, the players, they're basically, can, on the whole, they're best at either stopping goals, creating goals, scoring goals, and at younger ages, you want to expose them to all of them as much as possible until they get to a point where they're probably going to be better at one of the three, and um, it tends that those that can stop goals probably play in positions closer to their own goal. Those that score goals go in positions higher at the pitch, but it's not to say that they're going to be specifically a left winger. Um, we talk about them being adaptable. You go around principles. So you look at positional play again. Um, I guess it's three main areas. So um, numerical, so quantitative in terms of um, we need to have more players in the opposition in a certain area of the pitch. That's not to say that it's going to be anyone within a certain position. It could be 2v1s, 3v2s. You can try and replicate within training where there's always going to be a decision. Um, uh, qualitative would be um, someone just being better than the opponent. If you know that uh, there's a dribbler that's going to, on the whole, be better than the defender, then you try and isolate them 1v1. Um, and then just through the positions own time and space. So if they're taking up good positions on the pitch, can you try and take out players in the game? So again, it's all principle based as opposed to you're playing centre back, role specific techniques. You're still going to overlearn like one position all the time from the younger age groups. But I think as time goes on, you do find yourself being better at one of those three things of stopping, creating, or finishing. So you're going to be more exposed within training and games to play in those positions the closer you get to a first team environment. Um, so I guess rather than position specific isn't necessarily playing left back, you've got three options, this is all you're going to do. It's still principle based. And on the back of that, Mike, um, you sort of, like you say, you wanted to, with the um, shared affordances, then you're, you know, you're looking at still playing players in the position, but understanding what are the various needs of players playing in a posi different position so there's that understanding within the team when they're playing together that right my right back's got the ball this is what he needs from me i mute myself there <laughs> um i mean absolutely you, as the as the players get get older they'll joe's right they're, they'll they'll start finding uh positions or roles that they're perhaps more attuned to um and there are uh, of course uh, principles involved in uh, build-up play, attacking play, defensive play, that you as a coach have to be attuned to, to see, uh, I mean, using our philosophy of round through and over, you can see, okay, we're, we're getting stuck here. Um, why? Well, perhaps because the player's perception of the situation is, is not seeing the long ball into the space that the, the opposition have left. So we're, we're still very much working on, on, round through and over uh even up you know 15 16 year olds uh we're, we're still working on on that basis 
and the, the trying to improve their ability to see uh, if we build up plays of you know, as a classic example that you, you've always got a plus one principle because the opposition don't press with their goalkeeper so you've got one man more but within that 11 v 10 you're going to have perhaps a 5v4 or a 4v3 or or can we create that kind of uh, overload in certain areas and so you're you're looking with the we're looking with the principles around through and over how can we find that numerical advantage how can we create it and how can we exploit it um so it's it's fascinating to see yeah you're you're having to introduce more structure uh in game systems at an older age but if you go back and look at some of the 10 11 year olds playing and this tunes in a little bit about what Jan was saying about you know technique um, we do no technical training at all in those age groups and you can see a sort of goal where in a seven aside game that you know they've done seven passes um not one player perhaps has received the ball on his attacking foot and you think sort of tradition oh god you've got to you know show your attacking foot if we're going to go forward they've played a flip around the corner a little toe poke here uh, one touch there you know and sat bang 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 and they've scored and so that ability that they're developing there to just that sort of perception action uh, solution to a situation we see evolving into uh, players that once they start getting more structure perhaps through their own a lot through their own learning of, of the game that they can then whatever situation they end up in they can resolve and I mean I call for me coming from a much more traditional coaching model of working with systems when you see uh, perhaps our right back um, receiving the ball on his left foot, coming under pressure, goes inside, spins, does a 360, and then goes outside the player down the line. I mean, how many fullbacks do you see doing that? And you think, oh my God, you know, how we can't let him do that. that you know, that's not a proper right back. Um, but he, he gets away with it over and over and over. And so you think, well, actually, I can't stop and say, don't do that, because it works every time. And that's the position I'm in, that these players are uh, resolving situations in incredibly creative ways that you can't coach. I mean, it's them. Uh, it's their individual solution to it, and it works. Now, how far that will take them, I don't know. Um, and that's the sort of exciting thing with this, this coaching model that uh, AOK um, or route that they're taking because they are creating these you know you've got like Neymar at right back type thing <laughs> and well let's see where it goes but it is it is a very very exciting uh model but somehow my instincts inside are still saying mm, yeah okay but we're still going to need a bit of structure uh to get this but I do see that that structure can be coached from player to player so you as a coach, if you're aware, mm, we're getting stuck here, this isn't looking good, and then go in and, and ask, say, the centre-back driving out of defence, are you happy with what options you're being given round through and over? And he said, oh, no, you know, the forward's coming too close. Uh, if I play that, we get stuck because he can't drop the ball into midfield. Um, our full-backs disappearing down the wing or wing-backs disappearing down the wing too early, um, so I can't play outside. And there therefore translate that into shared affordance learning that they teach themselves how to play. And so they build relationships. Um, and I think that's the key thing somewhere. If you turn to say, you know, rugby, um, the England Barbarians game where uh, Barbarians scored 52 points against England, what was it? 25, 52, 21, 52. And the Barbarians are a scratch team. They come together. They're just, you know, they are brilliant players, international players, but they're not trained together. And they go out on the pitch and they absolutely wipe the floor. And they haven't got a system. They're just playing. And they're just bloody good at playing. And I think that is so exciting. If you can develop players that have got that sort of instinctive creativity to, um, you, you're going to get very exciting players coming through at the senior level.
I mean, yeah, and if you to go down that route, um, from what you were saying in, in India, I think your challenge there is that, right, you have very exciting players, but their, their toolbox of solutions seems, if you've maybe made it very sim simplistic, that <clears throat> it's like at every point, we're going to dribble. Um, so then how do you have that approach to say, clearly you don't want to take away what makes them enjoy the game. It makes, makes them individualistic, but also you do want them to get open that there are more than one option here. How, how would you go about that, changing that culturally? Well, um, that is at the same uh, moment uh, the uh, threat that I, I have a certain way in my head and that's the way that they have to do it and then I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> and, uh, um, on the other hand, uh, Mike and Joe both almost give already for me uh, the insight that um, about resolving situation and building relationships in, in football actions. So the one reacts to the other one and each other, not by uh, verbal, but just by showing uh, options or um, uh, pointing where they want to have the ball is... So when, when a player is dribbling and is good in controlling the ball, then uh, at that moment his head goes down. So he is surprised that, that there is opponent there. So then of course the only way to solve it, the problem, is to uh, keep the ball and dribble around that opponent or cut back and, and dribble the other side. Now another option is that you still dribble and that you control the ball and also looking around the situation. What is normally for us something, yeah, okay, Jan, that's an open door, uh, that knows everybody. But that is exactly the point, uh, what is uh, the teaching at this moment. So I don't want them to stop dribbling because, yeah, they love, uh, they're very good at it. The only thing is that the players are so, ball watching that they can't see other options so after a while nobody will create passing options or create um, a situation to play a little one two or uh, maybe even to distract the opponent that it's easier for me to pass the, that after a while that teammate is not going to do that anymore um, because there's no use because the player is not seeing him or her uh, so uh, that is uh, exactly uh, on, a, on a small basis what, what football is. <laughs> uh, so that you have that principle of, uh, like if we, if we take the uh, through them, uh, around them or over them, you can only do that if you are aware of the situation. If you're only aware of the ball, then of course, yeah, you will end up in trouble and then you solve the, uh, the problem and then you Maybe the ball goes to the opponent or to a teammate and that player solves the problem. There is no togetherness in that. So um, for us, the most important is that um, uh, every training session goes about awareness, has to do with uh, what kind of situation uh, do we have. Uh, be brave. Uh, be brave to drive into a defender, but at the same time, look for options how to solve that. So your teammates are going to give you solutions, give you passing options, give you the opportunity to play a little one too, or um, that the defender is distracted to cut off that line that you can go on your own. Yeah, that, that is uh, the pathway we want to go in attacking. Uh, defending, it's exactly the same, ball watching. Uh, so uh, not seeing that there is a, uh, an opponent running uh, in behind your back and go one-on-one uh, -on -one in front of the goalkeeper um, because we didn't cover that space. Uh, or, so that is um, that the, the threat for me is that I want to copy uh, my last experience of my last club uh, 
and that is um, that's not realistic for the situation where I am now. Uh, to 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 get that trust of the of the players and the coaches here, I have to start where um, where we are good at, and. Um, yeah, a very interesting uh, comment that uh, Simon uh, wrote, that's now already a month ago, but that he was still figuring out uh, what, uh, what sort of the solutions were of the playing style that in the ISL is uh, played. And that is exactly, uh, so we, yeah, we chat a lot about it. Uh, what kind of experience and 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 uh, sometimes disappointments he has, but I have the same uh, struggles sometimes. And then the biggest threat is that you start controlling and you put patterns in, and you're going to dictate and you're going to shout at players. Yeah, that is of course the old way, and in my eyes, that will never be successful for um, uh, multi-flexible players who can. Uh, okay, let's call it systemless football, but that they understand what has to be done in, in, in certain situations, attack or defense or transition. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that was sort of a kind of moving along with time. Touch a little bit on then how, as coaches, you adapt, or certainly as coach educators allow the sort of coaches under you to, to adapt. I think. Um, I mean, Jan, obviously you've touched on a little bit of the challenges that you face coming to a new culture. Um, but I'll start here with you, with you, Mike. Um, so you've mentioned coming into AIK is a, a very interesting work going on there. And you say even yourself as a coach that sometimes have to question whether, whether the ideology can really work in 100% in practice. So where is it? Where you've come in, where you know, where have you found those challenges? Where you may find little blocks yourself, and then to understand how am I going to deal then with coaches who are, you know, may have similar blocks when it comes to you know working with this new ideas of uh, shared affordances, how that working with constraints led approach, how that how that works in practice. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that is a real challenge for me because I've, I've come from a very uh, structured, perhaps rondos based um, approach to learning attacking, attacking play where you, you want to show your attacking foot in the most exciting angle that you can uh, receive the ball. So to attract the opposition there. So perhaps if you're marked, then we can play through or I can receive the ball, play it back in one touch and then split. Um, was that I now come to a club where um, the players, I've never seen so many players receive the ball with the, the back to goal and still come up with attacking solutions, uh, whether it's a little flip around the corner or you know nutmeg of the defender who's coming in um, behind. And that, that's a real challenge for me because um, in the model is, you know, let them play. And if you're going to coach, you, you want to, in the old school, you know, freeze play if this hasn't worked, but it's working over and over. And I have to then think, OK, maybe this style of creativity and receiving the ball uh, with your back to goal will be successful even in the future of these players or uh, won't it. But as long as it's still successful, I can't go in and start changing their, their behavior. What you can perhaps talk to coaches about, okay, when somebody's receiving the ball on their, uh, their defensive foot, their perceptual scanning ability is reduced because um, your body position is not open enough to see uh, the next option. And um, there, I think there is um, perhaps a room for development because you're so much of the solutions that the players um, are doing are, you know, perception action. It's, it's almost react to this situation, that resolves that, and that resolves that. And they string together long, successful se sequences of play. Um, the question is whether when they come up against more structured um, defend, defending, perhaps better defending, will, will this still be successful? And I, th I and I think the, the 
the learning will perhaps take place then. Um, there are still areas where you need to be aware as a coach that some player is perhaps trying something one, two, three, four times on the trot and still getting it wrong, still making the same, you know, or like Jan said, still losing the ball in that situation. And the coaches have to be aware that the player may not know that they're losing the ball, you know, four times on the trot. I, a few years back, I had a very skillful centre midfielder who loved switch of play, had very elegant passing. But I noticed he, he liked these Hollywood passes and there wasn't a lot of um, success rate in them. So I went to see, this was at a school, um, I didn't have his team, but I went to see his team play. And in this one half, he hits eight cross balls. Um, and I asked him, I went up to him after the game and asked him, right, you hit eight sort of switch of play cross balls. How many of them do you think were successful? And, oh, yeah, I was a bit off today, probably about five. And no, it was none. Uh, admittedly, two of them went out for the, the fullback, headed it out, and uh, the team got a throw in. But he just wasn't aware of the fact that um, he wasn't successful. And I think that has to be brought into like the, that model I had with that ball direction consequences, that if a player is continually losing the ball, there has to be some mechanism in your training design that makes them aware of that. And, and that is get back to the fundamentals that every exercise you design has got to have a win-lose uh, bit. And I, to jump one step, I was doing a, my old club, a 2v1 um, session and uh, with you know, two dribblers with one defender and you have to dribble into an end zone to, um, to succeed. And if the defender won the ball, they could counter-attack into another end zone. And I, in the middle of the session, I just stopped and asked these players, um, okay, what's this session about? And so, uh, passing? No. Dribbling? No. It's about winning. <laughs> and I think that that is the key thing, that if you're doing a 2v1 drill and they don't realise that they're actually succeeding, no learning is taking place. You know, they, so you, you have to have it, this sort of win-lose idea the whole time and I know specifically with kids football they say oh god you know it shouldn't all be about winning and losing but there has to be an awareness of if you just are sort of say oh great one two um, they're not going to learn they're not going to use that appropriately in matches and it, with this one team I noticed that it was a girls I think 10 year olds they were they were playing two uh, one twos all over the pitch and suddenly ending up with the quarter flag and going, uh, what do we do now? <laughs> so they were using it completely inappropriately. So if you design your training sessions with this sort of, okay, we can win in this way, you create players that are, oh, how do we win this? And that is going to create players that can really think on the pitch and find these spaces that evolve and, and manipulate them. So it is very interesting because, I mean, I think if you look at Graham Potter um, at Chelsea now, his, one of his games against, uh, I think it was against Brighton, and after 30 minutes or 35 minutes, he had to make a substitution because he realised that uh, actually the, perhaps the spaces that, that Brighton were um, offering up and the way they were pressing and closing down the, the, their system of play meant that, oh, I've got my my tactical planning completely wrong, I have to make a substitution. So I don't think, I mean, I haven't followed enough, but I don't think Graham Potter would have to do that at Brighton. So he's still in a process at Chelsea where the players are becoming much more tactically flexible because he's introducing new systems and ideas each week to them. But they haven't got to the stage where, for example, in the game against Brighton, that they could themselves solve it without him having to impose a, a tactical substitution. So it'll be very interesting to follow his progress whether you get to the stage where um, instead of having complete tactical flexibility in the players, which is admirable in itself, like you know, Pep Guardiola has at, at Manchester City, one week we'll do this, next week we'll do this to tweak the game to win it. But that's coach imposed. Can we get to the stage where that tactical flexibility exists within 
the team that they'll see, oh my God, this isn't working. Let's do this instead. And one of the first signs you'll get with this is perhaps a, um, a player, um, on, when I had a, an under 17s team, he could see, uh, he would yell out to, to me, Mike, should I press this guy? And it, it was an instant recognition that, hang on, our normal way of playing wasn't quite working. But he was seeing that and he was beginning to think, okay, we need to adjust this. And he would shout it out. And, and that, great, fantastic. The next step is he has the confidence to say, right, we are going to change this. I'm going to do this. You come in here, cover me while I press here. Um, so, yeah, there are different levels, and it, it, it means that there's a lot of work to be done uh, with coaches. And you, the problem, we, we work with parent coaches at, at AIK up to the age of 12, um, and that's actually fairly easy to do because we've got such fantastic design coaching from, that Marcus Sullivan and James Vaughan have designed for the, the younger players. And you go down and see our eight-year-olds play and you think, oh, my God, they're good. <laughs> they are fantastic. The way they, you know, so creative. So uh, it's just lovely to watch them playing these little combinations or dribbling or, and, and, and scoring, you know, going through that gate or winning the ball and knocking in um, the goal there. And, you know, to take the next step, you've got to be aware then that when they go back, these are the sort of central sessions we do, when they go back to their teams, is this parent coach somebody who wants to be Mourinho and wants to be the head coach that sort of runs things and, you know, plays his style of football? And so when they come up to our age group of 13, you have to see, OK, what kind of baggage do these guys have? And I, I use that in the, um, the my final slide picture there, that build up play, you know, with, with say, uh, say we at nine aside, we play goalkeeper 2-4-2 two, two. Um, these sort of two their, their reaction to one forward depressing okay we need to train them to resolve how do we best exploit this or two forwards pressing and to think they with two forwards pressing they will often try and go wider than those two forwards because it's it's a sort of cultural baggage from perhaps watching or perhaps when they played seven aside with their parent coaches and we need to then expose them to, right, now, today, in this session, why don't you try play inside of those two forwards and see what happens and just challenge them in new situations so that they're exposed to a new situation where their creativity can solve and they can think, oh, bloody hell, that was good. And then go away and, and do that, test that in the game. Right, we'll try go wide. It's not working. Well, come, you know, let, let's narrow in and see if we can beat the press that way so i i mean I, I just love i love the environment i'm in and I, my my background is being challenged the whole time but at the same time i i can see that i have got bits that i can add to this um ecological psychology uh model um that is so new really um in the way it's working so very very exciting yeah, Joe, um, and Mike opened up quite a few sort of challenges you'd have as a educator of coaches there. I think I think the two that stood out were clearly this idea of intervention. When when is appropriate or what is the mm. maximum amount of coaching talking time <clears throat> that you see? Um and I think the other one was kind of like session design itself. Yeah, you know, are, are those sessions hitting the target areas you as a club have stipulated i mean in your experience in your role what tends to be the biggest challenges you face uh with with coach education along those lines yeah i think uh we go down the route of intervention so traditionally you, you make an intervention based on something that has previously worked that's the reason you'd probably make an intervention so if i if i've stopped a session, told someone to do and it's worked, you're going to continue to do it because it might have worked the once. Rather than thinking about, right, it's not, it might not actually about the now, it might be about the later and understanding, I guess, the, the learning process. So um, the biggest thing for us is definitely around clarity. And I think personally, 
you talk about challenges, I think we're in a really good place with it. So building frameworks and models and ensuring that there's constant guidance on those. So in terms of intervention strategies, there might be three steps. It might be that um, you see a player, I say make a mistake. Um, step one is to see if they can self-organize and self-correct. If you see them make the same mistake again, your second intervention might be, right, I'm going to tell uh, little Johnny to go and speak to Tim and say, have you thought about doing this, et cetera. So we allow the players to be more interactive with the coaching process. And then if it continues to happen the third time, you might actually intervene yourself. That doesn't mean, again, stop the session necessarily. There's plenty of different intervention strategies, but just having that framework, straight away the coaches are looking for ways to help that player in a probably better structured way um, rather than it being at random. I would say about uh, when teaching, showing the players, um, show, show the players what to see, not no, where to look, not what to see, sorry. So constantly with defenders, for example, you're saying, right, three looks, ball man, teammates. And that's it. And then you start trying to build cues and triggers for them. And so they develop this ability to chunk a lot of information in a real short period of time. But if you try and stop the moment in isolation, you're probably never going to get that same exact picture again. So why try and coach that exact moment when they may not see it for another, I don't know, 2000 days. So um, again, as long as you've got frameworks models, uh, there's real clarity around those. Um, I think the challenges are, are far less. Then I guess it's just around being with them and constantly keeping them thinking about, right, without directly giving them answers and allowing them to solve solutions for themselves and be independent decision makers, um, coming up with different intervention strategies in order for them to do that, creating environments through constraints sessions that uh, afford that. It was interesting that um, Mike was just saying there about, about numbers. We're, we're very similar in the fact that... Um, if teams press with one, we'll play out two. If they press with two, we'll play out three. We'll play out four, they have three. Uh, the middle of the pitch, if they play with three, we'll create four. If they have four, we'll create five, et cetera. So it's all very numbers and space orientated. But you can only create that if you're constantly exposing that to them in training um, and giving them different solutions to try and try and solve. So hopefully when it gets to the game, um, they're able to do it for themselves. I think you look at, again, I guess on continuum. So kids, they go from a young age being very egotistical to um, being socially aware. So when they have toys as kids, they don't want to share them. And then eventually as they get older, they learn to share them. Um, it's no different with the football. Um, we see it with dependency to referrals. So as a coach at younger ages, players tend to be more dependent as they are on their parents. Um, they're constantly asking questions. They want help. And only through age and... Um, I guess education and if you do it like the way I'm saying the guidance gets lessened so when you get to say first team football or older age groups hopefully well they may only need the coach on a referral basis and that to me is success if we can not trying to put myself out of job but if we can make ourselves redundant then to me that's real success and then we're there when we need them and again we're just facilitating an environment for them to be successful as opposed to it being the other way around, we're actually, we're being egotistical later on in our age group and we're, we're doing things for ourselves as coaches um, and coaching sessions as, well, as opposed to coaching players and for what will best serve them in the elite game. Well, that, Jan, um, if I try and how, see how my ability to recall is, I think it was something along the lines of, you mentioned earlier, sort of coaches getting out of the way, which I think is what Joe is referring to there. It's how... How do you help coaches to get out of the way? So embrace the chaos that they're seeing in front of them. Um, if, if I go back to my uh, head of coaching role at FC Utrecht, uh, the previous four seasons, then uh, first of all, take the so-called pressure away from the coach that has to win. Uh, that is, that is uh, the first... Uh, Distraction for coach development. Uh, if uh, if if um, coaches are constantly under pressure and 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 start every week the same players and let the others just play five minutes or not at all, 
Ja, dat is, uh, is voor mij, of course, een um, sign of that, that there is pressure. So at that moment, um, yeah, you can't talk about a healthy um, development situation uh, for uh, the players, but also not for the coaches. Um, and, and most of the time, that is not something, uh, most of the academy managers say, just develop players. Uh, it's not about uh, only about winning, uh, uh, teach them how to get a, a higher result all the time that can be better attacking, better build up, better defending. But still, those coaches, they, they, they almost put them on themselves. That's also uh, some experience. So I think that is it, it, coaching should be a safe place. Another thing is that uh, that, that uh, individual player development pro that all everybody asks for what is the pathway with my son or daughter? What and um, I experienced a lot of times that um, I experienced a lot of times that um, um, that the, the delivery of an individual um, feedback on the development of the player that that is often um, uh, if if you ask the player okay what are we going to do uh, today um, then most of the times the players say you're going to tell me what i do wrong that is the start of the meeting with the parents and the individual player okay now let's uh, maybe uh, we can talk about other things uh, because um, uh, maybe it's about how you look at your personal development and how we as a technical staff look at your personal development or if we are still doing the right things and if we maybe have to uh, find some ways to uh, to make your personal development uh, uh, more successful. Now that's already a total different approach, but those meetings uh, that is part of 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 the coach role in a uh, professional academy. And most of the time, that that is not going that way. Uh, it's uh, eighty percent uh, the coach is talking and and giving judgments, and maybe. That is my experience in the places that where I started. So that is that's the second one. Yeah, so how can we help the coaches with that? And then of course, um, how can we help them to uh, to make their personal uh, individual development plans as a coach? Uh, so um, so what kind of things uh, can you evaluate yourself? Because how can you uh, teach something if you don't uh, are experienced yourself with making an individual um, a development plan, how difficult that is, uh, how hard it is to uh, ask for feedback uh, for, for maybe more experienced or certain people that you outside of football know, uh, people that can give you feedback, that can give certain insights in where you are standing at this moment and what pathway you could make to improve your coaching skills. So um, then the other thing is that uh, sometimes the head of coaching is also the one who decides if the coach gets a new contract or a higher contract or a higher team. Now that's, I, I was head of coaching and I had nothing to do with that. I, I, I didn't even know what they earned and, and how many hours uh, and that I just worked with them on a professional base. So that, that are a few points that normally at the start is already going wrong, in my opinion. Um, and then the second one is, of course, you have to look at the learning style of every coach and, and, and their uh, qualities, because uh, diverse, diversity is plus. And normally, I, when I have to select new coaches, I will normally select coaches that I like and that is normally a copy of myself not on purpose but that is just the be like me principle that is uh, there so uh, if you have more diversity in your staff 
and you are capable to uh, let them work together because that is of course a threat if you have a lot of diversity then you also could have a lot of discussions that are not uh, about football but more about i don't like this coach uh, because he is uh, he's doing this or that so that that uh, social environment for the coaches is um, a learning experience um, that they um, are um, requested to uh, press to do presentations about their working style to other coaches of grassroots clubs. That is a big teaching for coaches. Uh, just that are all tools to get coaches. Uh, in their strength. And when a coach is in his or her strength, then it's much easier to ask, okay, so this is your strength. What's next? What, what, what is that little small step what you want to improve on that part of your strength? How are you going to share that with coaches in the academy who are maybe not so strong on that point where you are so strong at and that that was my role so i had a total freedom to make that sort of um, a working relationship between people mentorship um, that uh, camaraderie of okay the only reason that we are here is with one thing we all want the same uh, and I'm not trying to win my game so I can pick your position next year because then I have a higher team and that uh, do I know what that might be good for my ego. But forget that, but that is maybe something. Uh, so when I look at coach development, the first, the second and the third thing we have to do is make a safe environment for the coaches and let them flourish and let them uh, go. Uh, in their strength and from there of course you you could guide it uh, this, that you say oh is that really the pathway we want to go uh, let's let's have a discussion on um what is all what is maybe also there uh, and yeah so that's 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 my uh approach to coach development uh steve Good old, lovely. Thank you, Jan. Um, sadly, I think that's all uh, we have time for today. Uh, we could go on for another couple of hours quite comfortably. Uh, but um, yeah, I think for that one, I think it's uh, time to uh, say goodbye and close the book and come back another day and start again. So Jan, Mike, Joe, I'd like to thank you for uh, your time today. and. Uh, sharing your insights and experiences uh, at your current clubs uh, around this kind of idea of systemless football. It was an absolute pleasure and also uh, meet you, uh, uh, Mike and Joe. Thank you. Nice. Thank you for having us, Steve. Yeah, thanks. Great session. Really enjoyed it.